Good morning and welcome to you all. I'm very pleased to have you, delighted that you could come along to this talk today. Um, I should acknowledge, of course, uh, the Beattie family who have made it possible for me to be here with the funding for that. Uh, and also to the research councils in the UK who've uh, been funding the research that we've been doing there. So that's the Engineering Physical Science Research Council and the Economic and Social Research Council. They will be now happy I've mentioned them. I looked at your backgrounds from the registration and thought I should take quite a, a high level introduction to 3D printing. I'm assuming not too much prior knowledge in here. I'm going to provide you with an introduction uh, to the topic of 3D printing. What is it? What does it involve? Um, in the context of the wider manufacturing landscape and then take you through some of the applications of 3D printing and some of the larger trends that we're seeing with manufacturing um, and leave you with some thoughts about uh, where we might be going with this and hopefully you go away thinking what, how does this affect us in our lives, in our organisations, what should we be doing with regard to 3D printing? Is this something that could be disrupting our business? Is it something that we could be using to disrupt others? So hopefully those are some things that you'll go away with. Um, where, did I, where did I start with this? Where did I start? Well, a little while ago, um, I was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge and we were having to look for money, as you do, searching for funding. And this was in 2013 and we started to hear all these comments in the media about this thing, 3D printing. It was going to be bigger than the internet, according to the Financial Times. It was going to be like the PC all over again. Uh, it was going to be Barack Obama coming on, giving State of the Union address, talking about how much it was going to revolutionize manufacturing. And it was in that context that we started to realize, OK, we should, we should be investigating this. But the thing is, we were, we're actually quite late to the game, starting in 2013. You had uh, Actually, this, this was the cause of all the excitement, really, around 3D printing. It was an open source project called RepRap. It was a replicating rapid prototype. And around 2005, a chap at the University of Bath, Professor Adrian Bowyer, he started this open source project to explore this concept of a machine that could uh, replicate itself. So. Uh, this is like the start of Terminator Skynet, something like this. So you, you can see here that we've got a nice little uh, plastic block there that uh, well, it looks kind of the same as some of these, uh, these blocks here. So this was uh, a polymer extrusion from a filament uh, to create some of the elements of this 3D printer that would then reproduce itself. Now, of course, all the metal, all the electronics, that's not, that's not being reproduced. But it's a st it's, it was the start. And uh, this was not a brand new technology at all. This was something that had actually been invented 20 years before. This form of 3D printing was invented in the 1980s um, by a company called Stratasys. But because of patents falling out of use, it became possible for others to start in exploring this territory. And so a whole number of people were drawn to this, exploring how they could apply this technology. And uh, you had uh, an explosion of interest around that, people coming in. Now, open source software, obviously much more accessible. Hardware, a little bit more limiting in terms of who could participate, just through the tangibility of it all. But you had companies being born out of this early open source activity, the most famous of which is MakerBot Industries uh, with their replicator machines. And so this was, at a time, a bit of a tension within this open source community, whether this was actually something that uh, was a desirable outcome, the commercial activity which led to the sale of the company. But you have got this, these types of devices now all around the world. You can go, that, go to a shop, you can buy it yourself, you can start doing 3D printing. And things like Kickstarter have really enabled this to take place. The crowdfunding that has allowed small companies developing 3D printers to get onto the market. So where you might have heard about some of these activities? Well, you may have read about it. The first thing we saw in The Economist about printing your own Stradivarius, about creating your own violin. 
Maybe you got scared when you heard about people 3D printing guns. Uh, Cody Wilson with dis uh, Distributed Defense, he talked about the idea that, well, okay, we could make this, make this gun out of 3D printing, and that, that really caused the media stir for some time. Uh, a device like that, that was a one-shot thing. Yes, it kind of worked, but were you really going to be scared of that one device? Um, and it doesn't really work very well at all with any degree of accuracy. And it's true, people have developed slightly better 3D printed guns, but in combination with exist other components too, made from other manufacturing methods. It's not exactly the thing that you should be scared of when you're talking about 3D printing. Things like the wrench that was being produced up on the International Space Station. Maybe you heard about that. The fact that you could send a file up to the space station for that to be reproduced up there. This flexibility that you can get from this technology. Or maybe you've seen some of these little mini figures that you can get a reproduction of yourself. These are little ways that uh, you, can, you can see a use at Christmas time, perhaps for a gift for uh, a friend or loved one to commemorate a moment, a step in the three-dimensional world away from photographs. And maybe some of these are the way, ways that you came across 3D printing. But what I want to do before going into 3D printing more about the technologies and the applications is to kind of rewind a little bit back in time to give a kind of a manufacturing context to this. Because for, well, 300 years now, really, since the, the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, we've been heading to, from a place of specialization and the division of labor towards more centralized and mass-produced forms of manufacturing. So go back to Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations where he talked about the division of labor and the example of the pin factory where, okay, you can have one person attempting to do all the stages to make a pin, but that's not a very efficient way of actually making pins. If you divide it into the 18 individual steps, then people specialize, get better, they learn around that one individual step and through the combined effort, you can actually get many, many more pins made in a day. And from that, you went towards Frederick Winslow Taylor and scientific management, the idea that if you can measure it, then you can improve it. You head towards Fordism and the rise of mass production with the assembly line. And then later, as you're going away from the fact that you've actually got labor involved, more towards automation and the displacement of labor. We've had trends there of shifting away from people ha learning to become skilled, gradually becoming de-skilled and then eventually displaced. The shift of manufacturing away from high cost labor economies to lower cost ones. And as well as automation, you've got other trends associated with the redistribution of manufacturing activity. And so in these cases, the barriers towards manufacturing become far greater when you've got to actually create these uh, ex uh, in install these plants which cost a lot, a lot of money. And you've got these smart manufacturing systems which are all about optimizing your production, about doing things in lean ways. And this is, uh, this is barriers towards participation. And so when something like 3D printing comes along, it starts to alter that perception about who can be involved, what can we make, away from the concept necessarily of mass production towards something about mass customization and mass personalization and the ability for individuals from around the world, makers, people who are enthusiastic about the design and the manufacture of things to actually be part of this as well. Just need to have the skills. So 3D printing, that's the term that's banded around the place. It's what we generally talk about in terms of the low cost entry level form of 3D printing, like the MakerBot replicator I just showed you. But in industrial uh, places, you might know it better as additive manufacturing. Um, and that's what it's described as. Um, if you want to have a definition, it's the, the layer by layer deposition of material to create three dimensional objects. Um, and in the way that uh, new technologies come along, it's had a host of other names too. In terms of the technologies themselves, there's seven broad categories by which uh, you can deposit material in this layer by layer way. Um, you can, uh, I'm gonna get, go into detail on three of the individual technologies, but broadly, 
you can take a, the first one, VAT polymerization. You can use a UV light to solidify liquid resins. You can jet material directly, or you can jet a binder that will then bind together the material substrate. You can extrude the material, squirty way, force it out. You can have a bed of powder, metal, polymer, and use some kind of laser to either melt or fuse that uh, powder together to create your solid objects. You can do kind of sheet forming, layering sheet by sheet by sheet to build up an object. And there's one company called MCOR that does that with paper. So you take your A4 stack of paper and you, you can actually have it layered and cut to create uh, prototypes. Or directed energy deposition, where you use high-powered lasers or plasma, arc weld, uh, plasma arcs or uh, electron beams uh, to deposit material directly onto existing objects. And so these are the, the seven main forms. Now, I've talked about it in very abstract terms, but how do these actually work? Well, here's one, the most famous one. This is the one that the RepRap project was based on, which has been around since the, the 1980s. Fused deposition modeling. This is a material extrusion technology. And uh, if you go to any kind of 3D printing shows, you'll find loads of Yodas, people who have produced Yodas, because that's what people like to do. Basically, what you have is you have a, a spool of filament. It'll be a polymer of some variety, normally a, something like an ABS, a PET, or a PLA. Um, and then essentially, all you're going to do is you're going to have a glue gun on uh, a CNC-controlled uh, system controlling the XY plane. And uh, either the platform itself that you're building on is going to move, or the head itself will move. And so the filament comes through, gets heated up, it melts it, and then it's able to deposit it down. And so it's going to move layer by layer, building up this object slowly. Stratasys, as I mentioned, is the leading company in this area. Uh, they have been developing this technology since the 1980s. But yeah, they had patents. Those only lasted for so long. That allowed other people to come in, people like originating from the RepRap project, to develop their own technologies based around this, uh, this basic concept of how do we extrude filament. Uh, companies that are also working in this space, there's so many to mention, but uh, two I'll just note. Uh, Ultimaker from uh, the Netherlands, um, you see lots of little tiny robots associated with them. And Tinkerine, who some of you may know, was actually founded by an SFU alumni, uh, Eugene Siu. So Tinkerine's one of yours. It's a Vancouver success story. And Tinkerine are really big into the education space. So they're doing a lot working with schools, helping people in schools learn about how to do the design side of 3D printing. So that's one technology. I'm going to talk you through two more. The next one is stereolithography. And here what you've got is again a polymer, but in the form of a resin. And what you're going to do to that is you're going to use a UV light or a diffuse laser of some type to basically solidify the top surface of that resin bath. And then after you've done that, you lower the platform down into the resin, you solidify the next layer down, and you keep on going down like that, layer by layer, until you're finished, up you bring the platform, and there's your final object. More advanced than uh, the first technology I described. Here, uh, you get much better resolution in terms of the final product, uh, so that you could potentially use this as a more advanced form of prototype, or potentially even for uh, your final production uh, component or product. Uh, so companies that are working in this space, the big guy who started off in this is 3D Systems. So they have a number of uh, prototyping and production-ready uh, machines that are based around this. Um, upstart, uh, people like Form Labs. Um, you can just go down the street on Pender and actually see a 3D printing shop where you will see some of these Form Lab machines with their iconic orange box, which really just kind of makes, sets them apart from any other machines on the market. Um, and uh, this is kind of like the second stage in terms of the sophistication of 3D printers. A 
A third type then is around uh, laser-based technologies where you're fusing together a powder bed. Uh, and here you have a build platform which is full of the powder. And in a similar way to before with the, the VAT polymerization, you are going to basically bind together the top layer. You're going to lower the platform. You're going to roll the new powder across. And then you're going to bind that top layer again onto what is underneath. And so in that way, again, you finish off, you bring it out, and there's your object. And where before it could have just been polymers, here we can also be thinking about some metals as well. So this is not just about simple things that uh, you, can, you can break. This is getting towards something much more uh, solid and production ready for the many, many different kind of industrial applications that we might want to use. Um, so metal powders have the problem that they're difficult to work with uh, due to uh, safety concerns inside the factory environment. But if you can manage that supply chain, then you've got another way in which you can go about manufacturing objects. Uh, the guys in he this particular industry, 3D Systems again, are leading the way in this, along with guys like EOS from Germany. And we're starting to see the first uh, sort of entry-level consumer uh, 3D printers based around this technology too. Uh, people like Sintratech from uh, Switzerland have just launched their S1 printer. And uh, obviously the cost of uh, a laser and the safety issues associated with that are a limiting factor towards its uh, development, but it's on its way. Um, and so what you're hopefully seeing from my examples here are we have got a high-end professional market that has been existing and coming through from uh, the 1980s with uh, the gradual improvement of technology there. But then since 2005, this consumer end of entry-level technologies that are coming in too. And these are disrupting the lower end of the professional market uh, with a, a cost differential at times of about 10 times. So they really are disruptive in that way. And those are ending up helping people in the design world do prototyping, which is the entry point for any of this type of activity. So it's helping designers do that. But then it's also then helping people do rapid tooling in manufacturing. So you can actually create molds and fixtures using these forms of 3D printing to help you to introduce customization into your manufacturing offering. And then at a, sec a third level, then you're getting to mass, mass customization, the potential for using these technologies to create final products uh, and final components that are going to go into your most, more sophisticated products. So this is where we're going from prototyping to tooling and then into final end part production. And I've got a video here to prove to you that this is not just a toy. This is not something that is something you're going to produce a, a, a little figurine um, that uh, is going to sit on your mantelpiece or something like this, but actually is going into safety critical applications. And this is GE who have been developing a fuel nozzle for including in their latest uh, jet engines. So this is a safety critical, critical application. And this has been developed over the course of uh, over 10 years in partnership with the uh, first one company, Morris Technologies, who they then later acquired when they realized they needed to know what Morris knew. And so this has gone into production this year. And this is some of the story behind the development of that fuel nozzle. When I was brought over to this job, they told me, you have to come over, design a fuel nozzle that is going to be 15% better fuel burn than what it's replacing. It's going to have 50% NOx margin. And by the way, your customer is expecting a fuel nozzle that lasts forever in the field, basically. And so that's a tall order uh, for such a high technology component. When Josh Mook was assigned that job in 2011, additive technology had reached a milestone. Developers were telling design engineers like Josh that they could finally use 3D printers for test parts. We really needed to have a confluence of the right materials with the right type of mechanical properties and that came into being in 2005 when we started working with a material called cobalt chromium. Greg Morris is a pioneer in the field, but Josh still had doubts. I personally was very skeptical. 
uh, not coming in from an additive background. This is a process that is very foreign to people initially. You're taking metal powders and you're consolidating those, micro welding those with a laser or an electron beam to create a three-dimensional object layer by layer. A fuel nozzle has a complex role in a modern jet engine, especially in a lean burn system. Additive technology offered engineers unprecedented freedom to optimize fuel and air mixing. The secret to designing a good fuel nozzle is proper management of air and fuel. Often I need very complex shapes. I need shapes that a machine tool cannot generate. I need hidden channels or cavities or whatnot that I cannot machine. Because these technologies are additive in nature and not subtractive, you can create designs that you can't create any other way. For instance, you can put in very complex internal passages, lattice structures, things that you can't cast, things that you can't fabricate, weld, machine. Additive technology brings to the forefront an ability to produce components and, and parts that you just frankly cannot make any other way outside of additive. Mark Shaw heads the nozzle design team, the person who would be responsible for delivering an additively manufactured part. There's always concerns with new technology. Um, and additive man manufacturing certainly isn't a mature technology. Um, the material properties are very good. The equipment is pretty reliable and has developed quite a bit through the years, but it's not to the same level of maturity as the subtractive processes. So there certainly were areas of concern. So the first milestone for me was when we first ran a nozzle that included some pieces made with additive manufacturing in an actual combustion environment, and they survived. Tests showed those first pieces would hold up and perform well. Circulating fuel temperature. The team decided to take things farther. So after that initial test where we said, okay, additive has a chance here, we now said, let's design the best fuel nozzle that we possibly can. We realized that we could start combining pieces together. And as we combined one piece and two piece, uh, we moved at some point and realized that we have 20 individual pieces here that perhaps we could print them all as one. And that was really the revelation. That was really the turning point in, the, in our thinking. This was a much more complex part, a bigger 3D manufacturing challenge. There was a period in time where we could not build that using the best that we knew from additive. That was a very tense time. Uh, I had a lot of senior executives saying, are you sure this is the right thing to do? I had to say, trust me. So that particular point in time, there were some extremely challenging geometry that were being presented to us uh, in fact, uh, we had some doubts ourselves as to could we build those components and meet those design criteria. I got a phone call approximately 2 a.m. in the morning. Never get a phone call at 2 a.m. in engineering. <laughs> right? Got a phone call from the manufacturer that said it did it, it completed, I think we can do this. And that, and that was it, that was the entire conversation. I knew at that point that we had it we could move forward, we were going to make this work. So it's not just a toy, not by a long shot. In the video there, so you heard that it was uh, something that uh, made use of uh, certain design freedoms. It's a uh, part count down from 20 to 1. This is incredible. They've taken a whole set of components and they've rationalize them, simplify the whole design. And that's great for like, the actual ability to go towards a uh, low weight, because when you're up in the sky, this is really important. Every last ounce really counts. But also for thinking about the supply chain itself, simplifying that side of things as well. So you're not having to engage with so many different suppliers. So you simplify the device, you make it lighter, they're also claiming that through using this technology, they're also making it more durable as well. So they're going to have to replace it less frequently. Also, if it does break and need to replace a component, they can go and manufacture it again. They've got the design file. They've got uh, their, their manufacturing facilities where they're being produced. They can produce another one and directly replace it. So it's also got the benefit potentially of spare parts. So you can help extend this, uh, the lifetime of the engine, which is very important if you're operating on service contracts. So these guys are doing it for real.
they're putting it into the market, they're scaling this up. But this is, this is, this is aerospace, where scale up is of a quite a small scale still. This is not the world of, of mass production yet. These are lead users who have very specific requirements. They're willing to make large R&D investments into that to see uh, these benefits. And that's what you can kind of see with the nature of how additive manufacturing and 3D printing is emerging onto the market. It's a, it's a matching process between the technological capabilities of these new manufacturing methods and the search for finding applications for them. And the reason why people are getting excited are, are numerous, but you heard in the video, it's about design freedoms, the novel shapes and forms that were able to be produced using 3D printing that you just can't make using existing subtractive or transformative manufacturing methods. So there was novelty in taking the 20 pieces and making it into one, using uh, various uh, parametric modeling techniques to make that possible. You've got the issue that the economics of small-scale production, you could actually go from, OK, how much is it going to cost to produce this one object with 3D printing compared to an existing method? And the economics are far in favor of 3D printing for small-scale at this point in time, because you don't have the tooling and the switching costs associated with starting up production. So you've got that benefit too. And when you've got that benefit, that means you can start to change each design. You're not stuck with producing the same widget over and over again. You can customize each one according to the needs of the customer. So you can go through that. You can share the designs. It's all digital now. So you can share, modify them, change them to what your requirements are. And there's also the fact that, well, this is, this is looking like a less wasteful process as well. It's an additive one. We're building up material. So it's not the case that we're chopping away, carving it up, getting rid of lots of material in the process of making it. So hopefully it's going to have some environmental benefits as well. And there's also issues to do with, or benefits at least, to do with how you do distrib distribution. Um, that there is the potential for more forms of prosumption, where individuals on a distributed basis are able to do the design work themselves, do the manufacturing, or do elements of this on a more globally distributed basis. It reduces the barriers to being part of the manufacturing system, what we might be describing as a, a more democratic form of manufacturing. So these are some of the things that we can see as benefits, reasons why we should be getting excited about this technology. Now, of course, this is an immature technology, as recognized in the video. There are things that need to improve before this can get more widely adopted, before it can find extra niches in which it can uh, grow and mature. The cost, the speed, these are, are very limiting factors at this moment in time. But people are working on this. There are new entrants coming in. People like HP, who this year released their own uh, multi-jet fusion printer uh, with a, an open uh, model for materials development. They're coming into the market with new devices. There are other entrepreneurs coming in with different printing technologies. There's problems those with skills. If you're talking about the uptake of this technology, do we actually have the skills to make use of it, the 3D modeling and CAD skills? It's a bit of a deficit there, but an opportunity at the same time. For a long time, this has been a prototyping technology. And so some designers are still stuck with that mindset that that's what it's for, that you can't actually use it for production-ready components. So a bit of a mental mindset change there. Lots of issues around materials, because the materials and the machine are such a, an intertwined combination that you need to develop the materials suitable for use in each of these machines. And there's a whole validation and development process, depending on what the application of those uh, the objects are going to be. What kind of material properties do you want and to be able to reliably want? But at the same time, if we have a proliferation of different materials, how easy are we going to be able to make recycling systems? If we're using a whole, so many different types of polymers, how well are those going to be reintroduced into the waste streams so that we can reclaim them later on? We need to have some standardization around them for the purpose of end of life management. In all of this so far, we're really just dealing with single forms of materials too. We can do polymers, we could do ceramics, we can do carbon fiber even, we can do lots of different metal uh, alloys. But 
Can we blend them together? Not yet. So that's an area that needs to develop. As well as the area of functional materials. So can we embed electronics that have functionality into them? People are trying to do that too. So these are, these are steps that are coming. Don't wait for them to just yet. And then a lot of it, this is done still very a very manual basis. Automation is required to make this a much more efficient and cost-effective process. And there's also a few issues people believe around intellectual property, although I think those are quite similar issues to the ones uh, around existing uh, digital technologies. So some reasons to be cautious. Also, just to put this into another context, is this is tiny in the grand scheme of manufacturing. Um, there are various ch uh, forecasts about how big this industry is going to be in terms of the equipment, materials, software, um, speculated to be maybe as big as 30 billion by 2022. So 30 billion US dollars. And that's in an environment where the whole manufacturing system globally is worth 12, tri 12 trillion. So this is still a spec at this point, but it's a rapidly growing spec. And it's growing and it's finding wider and wider adoption. So when we look at where we've come to now from what has previously been an emerging industry with lots of vertical integration, we're getting more specialist organizations coming through. And uh, so I focus so far on really who the equipment manufacturers are. But whenever you want to actually um, create something with 3D printing, you need to think about, well, wh what am I making? What is the design? Where am I getting that from? And so you're either going to be maybe scanning an existing object, or you're going to be developing it in your own CAD software. And even if you scan it, you probably need to do that as well. So you're creating a design that you're then going to be able to go and press the button and have it hopefully work out, because there's still some quality issues associated with this and the reliability. Now, materials, mentioned that before, very important. There are a whole host of material developers who have come into this area, working together in partnership with equipment manufacturers to develop the materials necessary. And if you are thinking about doing some of this yourself, if you're going to be doing the product design, then you may decide, OK, I'm going to buy that equipment in myself. I'm going to learn in the same way that GE did. Or maybe you're not going to be able to do that yourself. Maybe you think, OK, I want to test the waters. I'm maybe going to outsource some of that activity to an AM service bureau. So there's quite a few 3D printing bureaus that you can go and access engineering designing skills um, if you don't have them in-house yourself. If, though, you're the home user, you may be just thinking, OK, so what can I, what can I buy already? And uh, there are places that you can go to, uh, people like Shapeways. Um, and I materialize, Sculptio, these are organizations that have online distribution platforms where you can go and acquire digital files. And sometimes you can get them manufactured for you. Uh, you can modify them. In other places like GrabCAD, you can just share the files with other users under Creative Commons kind of licenses to allow each other to modify them and customize them to your own requirements. So there are a host of different distribution platforms out there which are enabling the fact that people can be part of this economic activity now. You, anyone can become a designer. They can put their files online. You, if you have your own 3D printer, can then take those files and you can become a manufacturer. It's shape, changing the distribution of activity. So in shifting towards something for the thinking about what's happening now, what's going to happen in the future. I just want to kind of present sort of three trends that I think are developing uh, and which you should be aware of as you're thinking about, OK, what's the future of manufacturing look like in regard to 3D printing? So three trends for you. So the first one is the fact that with 3D printing, we can create all kinds of customized and personalized items. We are not stuck with the Model T you can have any color you want as long as it's black. We can, we can change it. We can change these uh, designs to better fit with our own lifestyle. And where better is the, or the, the most, uh, most useful place in which case this can take place is the biomedical one. 
because every one of us is unique. Our bodies are different, and there are a great number of 3D printing applications that are being applied to the human body. Take the hearing aid. This was actually the first industry, really, in which production-ready 3D printing was used to create the shells for in-ear hearing aids. Um, so I, I like to think this is like some kind of molten chocolate coming out, but this is actually the results of uh, the stereolithography as the, the, these uh, shells have been brought up out of the resin bath. Um, and they've got, uh, you can see the shell itself with a bit of scaffold, which is material that will be removed, uh, that uh, hold, hold the shape in place and allow it to be built up incrementally. And uh, in this particular industry, there was, uh, in the early 2000s, there were six major players. They, one by one, started to adopt this technology. Um, it didn't do anything dramatic to the industry. The, the, a researcher, Christian Sandstrom from Chalmers University, looked into this. He thought, would this have disruptive effects? But he found no, it didn't. Um, it produced some uh, significant cost benefits and allowed the manufacturers to work more closely with uh, consumers and to get the products to them more quickly. But it didn't alter the uh, dynamics of the, of the market that significantly. Um, partly because this is just one component, it's the shell. There's a bunch of electronics that also needs to go into that. Plus there's other trends away from the in-ear hearing aid towards uh, the behind-the-ear model, which became more prevalent. But what was interesting about this application was the match between where the technology was at that point in time and the needs of the customer and the user. Because at this point, the finish wasn't that great. It was a bit rough. And for most applications, that was not what you wanted. You wanted a nice, clean, smooth finish. But for putting something in the ear, you put something too smooth in, it just falls out. The roughness was actually an asset at that point in time. So this was uh, the first case of very good matching between the technology and the market need. Dental applications, uh, well, losing teeth, dent, uh, so crowns, they could be manufactured uh, using uh, 3D printing. Of course, the limit here so far is the fact that no one wants to have a teeth that look like this. Um, you kind of want something that's going to match much more nicely. And so there's still post-processing that needs to be done with adding the enamel finish to your teeth. Um, for people who have had uh, dental alignments, things like the Invisalign are an interesting step forward in terms of, uh, of uh, braces, um, where you have a scan made of your, your mouth and your teeth, and then you basically have a 3D printed mold around which these, uh, these plates are produced, and every couple of weeks you get a new one. So it's gradually correcting your teeth um, through uh, something that looks much more attractive um, than the standard uh, metal braces. We've got things to do with uh, prosthetics and orthotics as well. Uh, and these are two BC success stories. Um, Weave, who produce uh, orthotics, so insoles for your shoes. So um, these guys were very successful on Kickstarter uh, last year. And uh, what you can do is you download the app, you take five pictures of your feet, and uh, then they get those, those pictures. They can produce a customized insole like this that you can wear. Um, I'm not on commission. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's showing you what is possible as well. Uh, you can get a full length, three quarter length, as I said, not on commission. Um, whereas, uh, Prosthetics, low-cost prosthetics, like being done at the University of Victoria with the Victoria Hand Project. Here, an upper limb prosthetic for those who have uh, no nothing below the elbow. Something that is of the order of uh, 20 or more times cheaper than the available technologies on the market. Um, so something like this here, which has been 3D printed, can be produced for about $100. Um, and with a bit of time, estimated $200 for fitting and everything. Um, and so this is basically making use of the fact that we can produce something like this on small scale, relatively cheaply. Um, it doesn't have to be the best technology in the world, but for those who don't have anything and doesn't have access in particularly uh, 
low-wage economies, then that can be life-changing. Um, and there's, there's other companies as well, organizations who are doing these low-cost prosthetics. Uh, the eNabler and the eNabler Foundation are another one that are doing for uh, those who don't have uh, full hands. And these are... So what Victoria Hand Project is doing an interesting model where they're setting up 3D printing uh, hubs um, in a number of developing countries um, and then enabling people to produce them themselves um, rather than here, we're going to do this from a distance. This is, let's let you do that yourself. Then something a bit more embedded in the body, things to do with uh, implants. Um, looking a bit ugly there, but facial reconstruction, a hip, knee joint, um, cranial implants, all of these can be customized to fit to the human body and uh, be uh, biologically compatible as well. Um, some are claiming that the actual texture that you can create uh, with the, uh, the hub of, uh, for the hip or knee joints could actually be better fitting to the body and allowing them to be uh, more uh, accepted into the body for longer. And then maybe what we're even more excited about, the potential, is uh, tissue and organ uh, 3D printing. Um, there have been some tests done. We can, uh, it's, it's seen that 3D printing of stem cells is possible. Um, there was a video doing the rounds recently of a beating 3D printed heart at scale, although there was questions around its actual validity, considering where it came from. But there are organs being developed. Now, this is not yet at the point, and not, won't be for some time at all, where we're going to be getting donors for it. But in the short term, companies like Aspect Biosystems, another BC story from UBC, they're developing uh, systems to be able to help with uh, the drug delivery development. So if you can speed up the time it takes for drug development by creating tissues that are replicating the reactions of human tissues through 3D printing, then you're going to be able to speed up how long it takes to get towards uh, full uh, approval from uh, people like the FDA. So that's, that's one thing that's coming along. And my hope is that uh, a report that was done in America around the insurance industry, looking at the effect of autonomous vehicles on the road and the way that they're going to get safer, is going to have a major downside on those who are waiting to have uh, organs because that's the main source of them. Um, that's the downside. My hope is there will be a countervailing trend with the emergence of 3D printing of organs so that that will happen simultaneously and that maybe the, no one will miss out and actually we can all just enjoy our Christmas drinks <laughs> knowing that uh, the livers will be available in the future. <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. So this is, this is, this is personalization at its most personal, isn't it? If we can actually have something based on our own stem cells, um, we can have organs produced for ourselves. There are philosophical questions about the nature of self at that point, um, but we can physically repair ourselves, potentially. So this is coming along in our lifetimes. The second trend I want to highlight is uh, improved sustainability. So I mentioned before that as an additive met uh, manufacturing method, you're just really depositing the material that you want to. There's not going to be so much waste in the manufacturing process. And so we can, we can see that that hopefully is going to lead towards greater sustainability. But let's, let's think about it across the whole life cycle. Um, because you heard from the example of G before, if, if we do some product redesign, um, we could maybe simplify more than just the individual component to be optimized for 3D printing. We can, we can go towards more integrated components, towards assemblies, and think about how can we create those in a more uh, e efficient, optimized way so that they're more lightweight, so that they are actually using less energy during the use phase, we can do that. There are, for people in aerospace, this is a big 
draw for looking at 3D printing because the fact that once the plane is in the sky, every last ounce counts. So let's make it as lightweight as possible. So people with high performance needs are looking at that lightweight in quite a bit. Even things like your belt buckle on the uh, Airbus has shifted towards producing a 3D printed belt buckle for when you're flying with them. And there's a whole ho hundreds of different small scale, non safety critical components that are being transitioned towards 3D printing in aerospace. <coughs> Whilst at the same time, some of the more safety critical ones are being explored and tested. Um, we've got uh, the fact that we can print on demand. The fact that you don't need to have these inventories which could become obsolete. That you can actually say, OK, we need this component, we need it now. Let's produce that for the customer requirements. So let's do that. Now, the big downside at the moment in terms of sustainability is the fact that energy intensity, at least in the production phase, is much higher, according to studies uh, coming out of Stanford. So uh, that's this moment. What we haven't had is full life cycle analyses that have taken into account the other savings along the way, as well as the fact that we're comparing um, an emerging technology that is rapidly getting better against some very established manufacturing methods that have been basically mature for a long period of time. So typically, people are comparing 3D printing against injection molding, and the advances in injection molding are not, not significant at this point in time. So we can do that. We can hopefully get benefits in the use phase, and then in the end of life phase as well. Well, there is the fact that we might be able to recycle some of this material better. Um, so there are devices like the Philobot, which is this uh, extruding machine where you, you take your existing uh, 3D printed components that you don't want anymore, you grind them up, you create them and extrude them into a new filament. People are you can do that at home. There are people who are introducing recycled materials into these filaments as well. Uh, companies like Philocycle, um, who are taking, um, where possible, quite uniform waste streams and combining them putting them into filaments. You've got new sources of materials coming from people like Metallasys, who are a company in the UK who are basically doing a low energy approach to production of titanium ores. And what they can do is they basically half the amount of energy and the cost for the production of titanium. So that, as you can imagine, excites people in aerospace and automotive quite a lot when it, you think, that it could be half the price of what it was before, aside from any environmental benefits that could come from that, from less energy being used. As well as the uh, on-demand production, we can potentially do the on-demand production of spare parts as well. So when things break, we can repair them. There are companies that are starting to put designs up online to allow people at home to do that. Uh, there's one French uh, consumer electronics company, Boulanger, who have put some of those designs up, allowing people to just do very simple uh, objects, components from those machines, and uh, repair them themselves. But at the higher end, people like uh, Siemens in their power systems, they are using some of these directed energy deposition technologies to repair things like uh, burn nozzles uh, in their power systems. And they're able to basically repair in situ as well using some of these additive technologies. So you can create spare parts or you can repair them as you're going along. So this is, this is changing the basis by which the business model might look like for a company. And so we would speculate, well, businesses that are based on just the sale of things, well, we, we kind of need, to, if we think about product life extension through the use of some of these uh, approaches, then we're thinking more about what well, service-based business models make more economic sense there. Do we have any examples of companies in this space that are doing that? Well, we do. We have Caterpillar, who are the big uh, industrial uh, manufacturing company who make the diggers and trucks and things. For uh, almost 40 years, they've had a remanufacturing business that has all been about refurbishing their engines. And they can extract a lot of value from the remanufactured engines that they do. They're trying to jump on board the 3D printing bandwagon by claiming that some of their cold spray technologies that they've been using are, are 3D printing. Definitional concerns aside, they're showing that this is possible. 
that you can actually think about, okay, we can use additive manufacturing technologies to extend the life of existing products so we get the benefit of both uh, financial returns as well as environmental benefits too. So these are ways in which we could think about closing the loop. And then the third trend I want to uh, just put forward to you is the fact that this is allowing more people to be part of it, greater, broader and more diverse participation. Uh, so the fact that anybody can become a designer, anyone can become a producer now. So uh, we've got the low cost or even free CAD software which anybody can use on their computer so you can become a designer. You've got these online platforms where you can share your designs or if you do them very well you can start to sell them. Uh, you've got access to production facilities around the world. Um, this map here is of uh, an online manufacturing platform called 3D Hubs and what they have is a, a two-sided market where you uh, if you, want, if you have a 3D printer, you can join their network. And so far, over 30,000 machines are part of this network around the world. And uh, if you are a person who has a, a design file, you can basically look for the nearest 3D printer that is going to meet your needs, send the file, get it produced and shipped to you. Now, of course, you can do that with service bureaus as well, but this is an online manufacturing platform that is gradually finding its way integrated into some of these other distribution platforms as well. Uh, so use of APIs such as Teleport from 3D, 3D Hubs is integrating into some of the other distribution platforms like uh, Thingiverse. So anyone can become a designer, a producer in this, this 3D printing world. Uh, if you're so inclined, that's the question, are you? Um, so one thing that this is enabling is greater entrepreneurship. So the fact that you can actually go about doing prototyping much quicker if you're just thinking about, OK, what does our, our product look like? So we can use 3D printing like that, and that's where it has been used for some time already. Um, nothing really novel about that. Um, but now we're getting to a stage where we can do the actual final production. You can create the parts that you want to sell. Uh, so many ways in which you might be using this. You might be using this purely as a demonstrator if you're looking for investment or to convince customers that this is something they should be buying. If you're going on via Kickstarter or Indiegogo for crowdfunding, you can put your initial prototypes up there and show them, well, this is, this is what the end thing is going to look like. And there's a whole host of opportunities for this kind of entrepreneurial activity, both within the kind of the 3D printing ecosystem Yes, you can go and try and produce a new 3D printer, if you like, for a new material. Or maybe you should be more thinking about, well, how do we apply this? What are the applications of 3D printing? Such as the biomedical ones. I mean, we've, the guys there just started last year. They recognized here are a, a confluence of technologies in smartphones and 3D printing that would allow them to do something and deliver value to customers. There is small scale to large scale, everything from the nano all the way up to construction. Um, there are opportunities in archaeology and the arts for capturing models uh, in the food industry as people are starting to look at seeing how they can 3D print food. There is, there is so many op opportunities. Some people who are taking advantage of this, uh, there's a lady called Stacy McLeod in uh, Mississauga, I believe that's how you say it. Um, and she's, she's done a very basic thing, cookie cutters. She, she wanted to make some cookie cutters and uh, she wanted to make some new designs. She didn't know how. Uh, this was a lady who didn't have any design background, but she got introduced to 3D printing and uh, she started to, to do this. And she started to create customized ones for some customers. Later she realized, okay, maybe I don't want to be customizing for every single customer. Not that bespoke. But once she had learned through that process, she's then starting to offer a range of 3D printed cookie cutters uh, with new ones being offered on a more seasonal basis. Um, then you've got hideous things like this, makey dolls. I think they're hideous. Maybe you like them. Um, these were an early success story in terms of 
a new company making use of uh, 3D printing to create these customized dolls. So you, you go to their, their website, um, you start to go through the make my doll process, and you get a number of different options um, as to what this thing is going to look like. You can have a Prince Harry if you want. Um, there is a, a limited scale of customization here. And that's what they realized that uh, they could actually just do yeah, cer certain, certain modifications to allow people have uh, a combinative uh, set of choices. Now, the reason I put this one up as well is because this has been a success story. And a success story to the point where the economics are starting to shift between do they produce them using 3D printing or do they go towards injection molding? And uh, that's something that the 3D printing industry has uh, been wrestling with because they obviously want everything to be done with 3D printing. This is not just like some kind of starter technology. Or is it? Maybe it is. Maybe that's what 3D printing is just for. It's for starting and enabling the early stages of manufacturing uh, for certain types of customized application like this. And just to continue on with the fun toy theme, my Little Pony, on one of the online platform Shapeways, some fans of My Little Pony started to do some designs and start to, to sell them. And uh, this prompted Hasbro, the makers of My Little Pony, to question, like, should we let them do this? And uh, they, they, being enlightened, realized, well, this is, this is good for our brand, this is good for our image, as long as they're good designs. And uh, so they licensed my Little Pony to some of these super fans and created this whole sub-store of super fan art. Uh, so they were embracing the fact that, okay, we've got people who are doing this for us. Uh, we can improve the popularity of it as a result. So they embraced these intellectual property issues by licensing to them instead of going, no, you cannot do this at all. Um, so that's just some examples there of, of ways that very low-end form-based 3D printing is enabling some forms of entrepreneurship. And I've mentioned before that this is, this is opening opportunities for people to get involved. And just a few quotes from some people who were got getting involved with 3D printing, um, acknowledging that, yeah, you can start to see that there's applications for this, that when you see there's a problem that you can overcome it with 3D printing that you can do anything you want and you don't need it. And I like this, you don't need a permission to create. And I bring this up because this is, this is coming all from women who traditionally are not part of the manufacturing scene at all. There are very few women in women and engineering. And something like 3D printing is ho helping to make that more accessible. Now I'm not sure, maybe we'll have a debate about this later on from the women in the room about how you feel about 3D printing. But the fact that this is a, a design technology is really helping people to embrace it um, rather than having to be in the kind of like, oh, we're going to go into the factory environment, we're going to be working with a uh, greasy, uh, greasy environment and we're going to have the guys, the lads talking in the way that they do. Um, this, is, this is opening opportunities for women to be a greater player in technology and engineering. Um, and there's a fantastic website which I can direct you towards, womenin3dprinting.com, where a number of great examples of entrepreneurs and uh, business leaders working in this area and the great things that they are doing. So those are some of the, the women are part of it. It's also a more globally distributed activity. So people in low, uh, low, uh, low, uh, low end economies, they're also getting access to people who are in more distributed locations which don't have the necessary infrastructure for large-scale manufacturing. Where you need diversity and uh, the ability to create multiple types of objects and artifacts, so often on a very uh, time-sensitive basis. So there's another organization called Field Ready that is going into disaster relief points and, help and bringing with them 3D printers to enable components and objects to be created that are needed on the spot for dealing with the fact that things just break and need to be replacing them. So that's what I wanted to offer to you, three broad trends that are happening. The fact that we're 
coming to see greater customization and personalization. Biomedical is the greatest example of that, but you can think about anything that you want potentially being customized to your needs. Now, whether that's cost effective is a different matter, um, but there are certain things that you can think of in your life which you may want to see customized. It's not just about creating the phone case that you want. These can be much more functional things too. We're seeing potential benefits in sustainability. The early signs are there. If we can get over the, uh, the production and energy intensity, if we start to look at the whole system and see, well, where's the, uh, the overall embodied energy? Is that actually going to be less through this? Well, very potentially, yes. And we're getting a broader participation of people in this, lowering the barriers towards participation, particularly around entrepreneurship, the creation of novelty. Um, the barriers towards things like software are very, very low already. Anyone could participate. But the, the number of organizations that have come into being here uh, to look provide the software and the hardware necessary is making it more possible for tangible objects to be created, which is, if anyone's thinking about doing hard startups, just a much more difficult thing to do. So it's making that much more possible. And whilst there's a load of industrial policies that we might want to think about, what I want to leave with you is thinking about, well, what do we need to do if we want to enable this in the future? And it's all about education, in my mind. We need to develop, as a society, the skills to be able to exploit this technology better. And so we're starting to see 3D printers being adopted into the education system, in schools and universities, where people are using them in design technology types of classes to learn about how do we do this? How do we design for 3D printing? Um, we're starting to see that. Often, though, 3D printers are being used to create objects to support learning in other technology and uh, other subjects too. And that's very helpful indeed. We've seen the biomedical applications, things to do with the human body can support learning in, uh, in anatomy, uh, can support doctors as they're training, replacement for human cadavers in some cases, um, for doing uh, various uh, dissections and whatnot. So that's another application too. So education development of skills, the understanding that we can match these skills in development of design, 3D printing, and go and find opportunities for them. And that's something I'm going to be trying to do next semester when I've got a course where students will be doing just that, um, trying to develop. There will be business students who are trying to learn how to do some 3D printing and match them to opportunities. Um, and hopefully by the end of that, we'll see some prototypes at least, if not the, the seed of new ventures come out of that. So hopefully at Opfest down at Surrey in March, you might be able to come along and see some of those uh, actually take place. So investments in education are going to be critical. And if Canada and BC wants to become a leader in this next manufacturing revolution, then it needs to be thinking about how are we supporting people to learn this? Can we just rely on people creating make spaces and fab labs? Um, people just gravitating towards it themselves? Or do we need to actually introduce this as courses into schools, into universities to actually ensure that alongside things like coding that we've got an ability to make these things and be prepared for the future? So these guys are the future. Let's make sure that uh, they're developing the skills they need for whatever the world comes along. So that's it from me. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Uh, if you would uh, like to read more about the project work that we've been doing, uh, capturingthevalue.wordpress.com is our project blog. And uh, thank you very much for all your attention. <laughs>Got two questions for you. The first one is my favorite go to tool for any massively hyped industry is the Gartner hype cycle. And I noticed that th consumer 3D printing is well on its way down the ski slope into the trough of disillusionment, whereas enterprise 3D printing is on the slope of enlightenment and seems to have found some sort of a sustainable business model. 
But what this means is there's, there's a lot of very unhappy investors. There's going to be blood on the tracks in terms of anybody who tried to go into the consumer segment of 3D printing. My question for you is, has this put the brakes on the whole industry? The fact that it's massively missed these, you know, ridiculous uh, expectations that were created at the outset. I wouldn't say it's put the brakes on it. Uh, I think for a period of time, um, there was a reaction from the market, uh, reflected in the, the market capitalization of the leading companies, um, towards whether this was going to be as big a thing as it had been anticipated to be. Um, I think anybody who was paying attention um, around 2012, 13, when the, it was getting to the peak of inflated expectations, would have really been able to see that these consumer 3D printers were not going to be world changing in the way that uh, they were being built. Um, this was a technology that had been around for some time. It had had 20 years beforehand where it could have actually become something much more, but it didn't. It was slowly being developed um, uh, and finding application and prototyping. That it would suddenly come into the home and be able to produce everything you wanted um, was not realistic. Um, but it attracted so much media attention uh, that people started to believe some of that hype, didn't they? Um, so there has been a little reaction on some of the uh, crowdfunding platforms towards that. Um, so but you are still seeing new 3D printing technologies and applications of it coming onto things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo and still getting massively oversubscribed. Um, not quite as oversubscribed as at that peak, but still, um, because they're, they're getting smaller and smaller. There are small ones that you can even get, um, which I didn't include, uh, which will use the light from your smartphone to create 3D printed. So that's using the, uh, the stereolithography process. So the white light will then cause the VAT polymerization. So new things that like that come along and people go, wow, that's amazing. I'm going to get that and it's going to cost less than $100. I'll have a piece of that. Um, so as long as there's exciting new things, people are still willing to uh, start to invest it. Now, in terms of large scale investors, um, that uh, what you have seen a little bit are the acquisitions in the market. So consolidation around, um, by, particularly by 3D Systems and Stratasys, the two major players in this market, have around, they've been on an acquisition spree, it's fair to say. They've gradually gobbled up the smaller players. They've included service offerings into their business. Um, in Stratasys's case, so this is ironic, Stratasys developed the filament extrusion technology in the 1980s. MakerBot came from a, 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 an open source project in the late 2000s based on that same technology, 20 years out of date. Stratasys in 2013 bought MakerBot to have that low cost entry point into the market um, because it was just a, a more cost effective way of, of accessing that uh, rather than building its own business up. Um, they overpaid. That's safe to say, because they bought it at that peak time. Um, but uh, yeah, more recently, guys like GE are acquiring and becoming more vertically integrated because of the need, the, the very limited number of sources of technological expertise at the very high end. Uh, so they bought companies like the Swedish company Arcam, which does electron beam melting, uh, and SLM Solutions from Germany uh, to really solidify their position in this aerospace market. Um, so it's less about large-scale investment, more to do with the industry dynamics of consolidation at this moment in time. I'm interested in uh, what you can tell us more about the materials, uh, mm -hmm. and particularly the multi-materials. Uh, my area of interest is food, that it was just tangentially mentioned, uh, mentioned, but I'm, I'm particularly interested in what materials are currently available and what are being developed. Okay, so the one thing you've always got to remember with 3D printing is the, the match of the material to the, f the, the type of 3D printer. So uh, some just aren't compatible. Uh, so you look at the technology and then you look at the, the broad range of, uh, of materials that could be used for each of them. Um, essentially though, 
pretty much any material that you can think of can be 3D printed. Uh, you just have to change how you deposit it. Um, so most people are approaching it from still the material extrusion perspective. Uh, so the basic form, they're polymers, but you can also get uh, some wood filaments as well. So these are wood powders that are embedded in an epoxy resin, so you can actually essentially make things out of wood if you want. Um, people are even trying to do that with metals as well now, so you can extrude a metal, uh, but you need to find the right melting temperature. That being a different method towards the, the powder bed binding of metals. Um, there are also the extrusion of uh, liquid metals as well, without any additional binding in there, um, which they help avoid the problems with uh, the powder control, which is a safety concern. Um, and those are basically whatever metals that you can think of um, and their alloys. So everything from, from steel through to your precious metals. So jewellery is another example I didn't mention because there's so many to mention. Um, but gold, silver, platinum, they are all finding applications in specific forms of, uh, of 3D printers as well. Um, people have done things with carbon fibre, um, with ceramics too. At the construction end, you've got concrete being deposited. And when you come to something like food, um, there are some uh, examples. You maybe have come across things like the Fudini, um, which is... Uh, now, I'm, I'm sceptical of this as a, as a whole thing, um, just because it seems like we can make food in a better way already. But um, they have one example of creating uh, pizzas. So uh, you have your platform. You extrude the, the, uh, the material that's going to be your pizza base. And then you extrude the tomato sauce on top. Um, and I guess, I can't remember, but you guess you could extrude some cheese on the top as well. And then you can cook it. Um, I think there's better ways we already have of making better pizzas. Um, but I'd be interested in tr trying, tasting that one just to find out. <coughs> yeah. so I have a related question. Um, my naive assumption would be that advances in nanotechnology, both nanoprocess technology and nanomaterials technology, might be converging with this space. Is that correct or is that AI? Yes, it is entirely correct, yes, at the very small scale. So um, one example that comes to mind is in uh, fuel cell and battery technologies, where that convergence is very much happening, um, where if you can, yeah, you can print uh, I say print very loosely here, uh, at this very, very small scale that you can build up structures that allow, um, it's, it's the, the, the boundary between the different uh, materials in the and battery. We, we deal with powder particles and plastic particles and we melt them, bond them and build them up. Is, is the future that we'll be dealing at the molecular level or the nano level? Is that, is that likely that we'll be building things up at that level? Not everything. I think very specific applications. Um, yeah, I mean, if you think about uh, semiconductors, we could see uh, a future in which those are being built up in that way, at that scale. Um, but, I mean, speed and performance issues will just mean that for, for most applications, it's about finding the, 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 uh, the resolution, the scale for that type of object. I was curious as to on the GE uh, fuel jet thing, um, roughly how long does it take to make a part like that? Ooh, um, I'm trying to remember. That's of the order of days. Uh, not, yeah, I th I'm trying to remember. I think it's, it's over a day um, to, to actually produce that because of the fact that you kind of started to see in the video how the laser was making its tracks. And it's, that's at a, yeah, a very small re uh, resolution to make sure it's very, very accurate and to make sure that uh, you're not uh, getting any porosity in there that you don't want, you don't want any defects. Um, one of the limitations to performance of that is understanding exactly how these, these, uh, these particles actually behave when the laser is hitting them. Um, and that's something that the, at the basic level of science is trying to still be understood. Um, that has 
in some ways been a bit of a, a craft-based approach to this so far that science is just catching up with. Well, in the safety conversation, in, in my mind, there, in any manufacturing <coughs> process, you're going to have failure. What's the failure? I mean, we don't even know. We, when you test it out, it, you get it into a real consideration, it can be very different. Um, well, I believe that they have tested this to Six Sigma, I think, for that component. Can't say that for every <laughs> 3D printed component, but that's what they need to do uh, for that application, so they have. Um, whereas, uh, for yes, your, your home 3D printers at the opposite end of the spectrum, they often just go entirely wrong um, for climate reasons, for the fact that the nozzle just gets stuck. It's just a, a low cost technology that can just go wrong. Uh, and that's another reason why it just sometimes doesn't seem to be as good a thing as build. Um, the home user, if they are actually designing something, wants to press the button and expect it comes out right, um, isn't so tolerant of, uh, of things going wrong. But more so in safety critical applications, you definitely need to know that's, that's going to work. Oh, please. Uh, okay, construction industry, I'm interested in the construction industry, and uh, I could imagine to build a uh, high rise building, and all the elements are actually produced on site. Mm -hmm and then assembled. Is there already something like that happening or? Yeah, there's some, some, some people working on this. So in, uh, there's a one organization called Contour Crafting in the US who is exploring this. Um, famously in China, there have been some buildings produced. Um, you can look it up, just put China 3D printed houses. You'll find stories about that. Um, it's, yeah. You, if you, you bring your, your large scale 3D printer and then can just basically press go and let it build what you want. Um, of course, you need to bring your materials there in the appropriate form, various forms of cement really, um, and allow those to be extruded layer by layer. Um, it looks kind of odd, um, these big fat, because it's, it's not very, um, very detailed. You end up with these kind of blobby kind of walls um, because you're actually trying to deposit a lot of material at once. At least that's where they are at this point in time. And then you would put separate cladding on the outside. Um, but I think it has a lot of potential in terms of uh, being able to include kind of all of your uh, fixtures and fittings and utilities into the design. Um, it has the advantage that uh, you can do it on site with very low uh, waste and with very low labour. Um, but it doesn't have the finish is nowhere near where it needs to be yet. Um, and prefab is perhaps a better, better economic bet at this point in time. Um, but it has, as with all of these, potential for, for customization. Um. Um, on the topic of quality and safety, what are your thoughts on sort of you know entering into this sort of citizen design era where people are sharing mm. Designs. I mean, where does it sort of seems to me it's almost a can of worms for liability and safety and yeah. who's responsible and um. that's a really really good question actually yes because as if you're a GE then you're not going to allow anyone to be part of that system you are going to design yeah. it you're going to be using your certified equipment with certified materials but when you yeah when you start to enter into a Okay, well, well, what if I, was, um, if I uh, had a car with, and I was out in the middle of uh, the Australian desert and I wanted to produce a component? Um, okay, I might be able to download it, but is it actually going to work on this machine that I've got using the materials I've got available, um, which may be, I don't know, black market or something like that, um, non-certified? And you, yeah, you're right to bring up the issue of liability. Um, I think this is one of the areas that's not been fully understood yet as to who is liable, whether it be the designer, the producer, uh, the equipment producer, you as the consumer who is actually producing that. Um, I haven't got into the legal side fully, so I don't know exactly who is responsible. I suspect it's, it is a can of worms based on where you're doing this. Um, and when some of those entities are geographically distributed and subject to different laws, and legal systems, that's, yeah, even more messy. So I don't have an, a proper answer, but you're absolutely right to bring that up. It's something that still needs to be explored and understood. I was going to say on that topic, a lot of those issues come up with open source software. So 
I mean, no large company wants to touch open source software unless it's thoroughly vetted because the liability, either from a safety or from an intellectual property perspective, is a mm -hmm. nightmare. Yeah. I wouldn't build an airplane with a part either. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah. You, you, you um, yeah. You're going to choose the level of liability that you think is appropriate to you as a business, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Disruptive technologies. If you look at what happened with the icebox and refrigerator, that was a disruptive technology. It mm -hmm. only took a couple of years and kind of swept over the face of the world. This doesn't seem to be a disruptive technology yet. Is, is that a fair assessment? When you say the refrigerator icebox has yeah. swept the world in a couple of day, years? Well, no, no. The concept of getting rid of an icebox and getting a refrigerator, it, it kind of took off and it disrupted the icebox game. And so when it did that, it actually changed because electricity, there was a convergence of things. Mm -hmm. This doesn't feel like it's like that yet, but it could have the potential to be that. Is that a reasonable assumption? So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave aside the academic definition of disruptive at this point in time. Um, I, I believe, yes, it's, it's going to have a disruptive effect on the, the industrial system. Um, as I commented earlier on, it's, it's a technology that's maturing. It's very slowly maturing um, and looking for applications where it can find use. And so it's found it in things like the hearing aids, gradually into dental into aerospace and automotive. So these, these users with very particular performance needs. And so you'll, you will see that as the performance of the technology gets better, the number of opportunities that it can meet to increase. Um, and so, yes, you will get disruption on the application side. <laughs> Bless you. Um, what is interesting about this is the fact that we're, we're we're actually putting an umbrella over a whole host of different technologies that all just seem to be coming through together at the same time. Um, they are actually disrupting each other. Um, the, uh, the low cost 3D printers are disrupting the uh, prototyping end of the professional market. Um, the, when the SLA printers come in, they're displacing some of the FDM ones just because they offer a better resolution, better quality. Um, but yes, for the larger manufacturing system, it's doing that very slowly. Um, if you want to go back to the academic side, you can say, well, disruptions do take time. It's a process. It's not something that happens really overnight. The icebox um, might have seemed like it came overnight, but like 19, uh, sorry, 1850s, 1860s, that was when the first uh, refrigeration devices from Ferdinand Carre and uh, they were developed. So, there was a, a long lead time before it got to that point where certain aspects of the technology were gradually being improved. Um, the costs coming down, performance improving, often getting smaller. Um, and that's, that's what we're needing to see with 3D printing here. Um, the performance and the speed definitely needs to improve. The range of materials um, and the, the multi-materials elements, those all need to combine together. So it's coming. Um, and what, all I can say is that anybody who is interested in this, um, interested in a 3D printed future, should try and develop the skills to be able to exploit that um, because that will enable so much.